not a surprise, the 12th round of China-U.S. trade talks came to an end in Shanghai without a deal, although both parties conducted a candid, efficient and constructive exchanges on major issues of common interest in the economic and trade field. The two sides will continue the negotiations in Washington in early September. But how shall we reveal the outcome in Shanghai this week, if any? What are the major divergences at this stage between the two major economies? And will the deadlock be broken in September? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the Beijing studio today by Professor Jiang Gong of the University of International Business and Economics. Sitting in Hong Kong with us via satellite is Robert Kapp, director of the Economist Corporate Network. We will also speak to Stephen Roach, a economist with Yale University via Skype. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Ray. Welcome to Dialogue. John, what exactly do you think of the outcome? Is it a surprise or do you think China is more patient and waiting for something to happen? Well, I think uh, given President Trump's lengthy, you know, raving and raving uh, before the, the talk, I'm not surprised that uh, both sides sort of walk away with very rational statements at this point. I think it's still a long way to go before we can conclude a kind of a very broad, large trade deal here. Um, when you look at the two statements from the two governments, uh, there are some differences. Uh, there are some commonalities, but I think there are some differences too. Um, <coughs> it's interesting to explore these differences as we, as we go along this program, I guess. <coughs> the big issue, I'm afraid, this moment, at this moment, uh, Robert, is uh, whether President Trump uh, is still pursuing a zero-sum game or a win-win situation. It seems to be a long process, even if not a new long march. Do you agree, Robert? Well, yes. I mean, that, you know, the, the notion of win-win and, and zero-sum, I, I don't think that's part of uh, President Donald Trump's calculus. He's looking at this, in fact, he looks at all of global relations in terms of bilateralism. So he sees a disadvantaged uh, position for the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis what's going on with U.S.-China trade, and he's wanting to get concessions that work for America. Uh, I don't think they factor too much into will this work for China. They are looking at it, well, China hasn't lived up to its WTO obligations. It's been unfair towards America. So from the Trump viewpoint, they're trying to rectify that. There isn't much thought of a win-win. It's more getting the balance right. Steve, what do you think? Well, I think we have returned to the... Um, the framework that existed prior to the breakdown uh, in early May, uh, which has a, a, a bilateral trade piece that was just mentioned, as well as uh, a long list of structural issues. And I think we're stymied both on the, the bilateral piece, which is not going to solve any problems for anyone, but nevertheless has a political appeal uh, to the Trump administration, uh, but there's no progress made on uh, the structural front. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we are at a standstill. I'm not optimistic that we're going to uh, catalyze uh, the progress by any new developments uh, in, in uh, September or even possibly in, in the months belong, uh, beyond, but I think, um, uh, you know, it's good that the Two, two parties continue to uh, uh, talk and speak and exchange views, but the framework for resolution uh, is missing at this point uh, in time. John, what do you think of the rip of accusation implied in the presidential tweet of Donald Trump? Uh, he accuses China of always uh, seeking to change the deal to China's benefits, but what are the real structural issues? that may have led to the, you know, the standstill? Um, well, the, the rip-off statement is not surprising to me. I mean, he has been talking about this for a long, long time, ever since, let's say, uh, uh, candidate uh, Trump. Uh, he's always been viewing the trade issue in the context of, uh, you know, us versus them. Uh, trade deficit to him is loss. 
uh, the 300 some billion dollars of trade deficit is, is money stolen away from the United States. I mean, this is real for a long time. Um, but I think uh, what's interesting, you know, from my observation is that it looks like, you know, before we reach a grand uh, agreement, it looks like there might be some incremental concrete steps being made before reaching that step, that milestone of reaching agreement. For example, the agricultural purchases. And I don't think China is going to wait until this grand agreement is reached before uh, China makes uh, some uh, major purchases. From China's statements clearly uh, shown that China is ready to uh, make substantial uh, Purchases. But obviously, from the Chinese side, we urge the United States to create some favorable conditions for the increasing purchase well, of American you, 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 agricultural produce. Right. It, it's very interesting. In the U.S. statement, the White House statement from the you know, White House uh, spokesperson, we don't have that part. The second part just said, upon, you know, conditional upon hmm. U.S. creating favorable conditions. In the Chinese statement, we have that. In the U.S. In the US statement, we don't have that. But what does that mean, the favorable conditions? I'm keeping thinking about what does that mean, the favorable conditions? I think one thing probably um, can be on the agenda is the treatment of Huawei, for example. Taking Huawei off the entity list could be one of the favorable conditions. Do you think this is a process of trade-off? I think um, it's going to be, it's not going to be just one-way concession from mm -hmm. China's side. Uh, it's going to, got to be a, a both ways. It's got to be some concessions on the U.S. side as well. I mean, concrete steps, not some kind of promise, something that is taking effect right now. Because the purchase of agricultural products is taking place right now. We start this process, Chinese companies are talking with American companies, finalizing the purchase list, and we're ready to make the order. So this is happening right now. So I think um, this helps with American farmers, and in return, the United States has to deliver something in concrete, mm -hmm. in substance, not just a promise. Well, Robert, uh, what do you think of the issue of sincerity, an issue that the spokesperson of the Ministry of Commerce in Beijing raised over and over in the open and public statements? Well, uh, I think what John was just saying is also very relevant to bear in mind to your question there, Young Ray, and that is you actually have very different statements that emerge from these discussions. Uh, we've seen that before. We've seen it again now. So the, the, the Chinese side seems to, along with the lines of sincerity, want to see the U.S. move its position. The U.S. position, to boil it down, has pretty much been China needs to change its entire economic system. It needs to do it right away. And as I previously said, it sees the Chinese trade policies as very unfair. So it wants all those changed. And perhaps China is looking for something that's a little bit more actionable, uh, even though I am sympathetic to the U.S. demands for more openness from China and a, a fairer trading relationship. I think the Chinese have a very good point to say this expectation that, I mean, almost overnight, China would change its system to suit U.S. demands is pretty implausible. Mm -hmm. So I would believe the sincerity uh, statement is relating to the U.S. making more practical uh, requests of China that it could then act on. And, and those would also include things like what was just being talked about regarding Huawei. I, I definitely see that as one of the key concessions uh, China is looking for before it starts buying more things like agricultural products. Let me cross over to uh, Steve. Uh, what do you think of the issue and its relevance uh, for reaching a deal between China and the United States? For example, the release of Meng Wanzhou, who is still under house arrest uh, in Canada, as well as resumption of supply of some core parts, spare parts, from the United States to, to Huawei. Do you think this is a test of the sincerity uh, from the perspective of the Chinese government? Yeah, I think those are good points. It, it, w it is not um, going to be that easy just to take Huawei off the so-called entity list. There's a lot of <coughs> uh, political uh, theater involved uh, in the U.S. Congress that might prevent that. So the best way to approach the problem is the one that is, uh, appears to be underway, and that is making this, the supply chain distinction between uh, components that are uh, not uh, perceived to be damaging uh, to national security, but even that's tricky. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, pressures from uh, leading U.S. technology companies, though, to, to push that. In terms of the, um, uh, the Canadian uh, uh, extradition uh, uh, trial, um, that's also another possible angle, but I don't, don't I, I don't, do not look for the United States 
uh, government and the Trump administration in particular to just take uh, the entire Huawei issue off the table. Um, this this particular uh, problem is, is now moved into the political arena from which it will be uh, much tougher uh, to uh, extricate it from. Obviously, the two economies are locked up in animosity on different fronts. So for example, um, what, what do you think of, uh, Robert, uh, what do you think of, say, uh, the alleged verifiable coercive implementation of what has been agreed upon in the early stage of the agreement between the two sides? That's the American mm -hmm. perspective. Uh, what do you think of the implications there? Yeah. Well, the U.S. has long argued that it can't just have another deal with China. It wants to have uh, an enforceable agreement. And that's also something the Chinese side has resisted because the implication, as I've heard it, is the U.S. negotiating stance is, well, we leave the tariffs in place, and yet we can further punish you if you don't abide by the terms of the agreement. So and that's where the enforcement mechanism comes in. So apart from how you affect an enforcement mechanism, the notion that the tariffs stay just where they are, I think, has been a big stumbling block for the Chinese side. And, and yet, at the same time, I will say, based on the statements that came out from this Wednesday, it appears that there is a movement. I heard some uh, statements from the Chinese side regarding discussions in September to regard enforcement. So that could be a positive way forward. Maybe they both found a means at which to find a medium a happy medium, as we say, where it's uh, enforceable, but uh, enforceable in a way that's acceptable to China. John, what do you think of well, uh, the, the, the so-called being enforceable? Well, uh, the tariffs have to be gone. I mean, there's just no dispute about this from our perspective. I think, uh, you know, this agreement wouldn't exist as an equitable agreement with these tariffs still in. Uh, it has to be gone. I think this is a precondition. I think it's very stated very clearly a couple of times by the Chinese government in the Mafcon's white paper, by uh, Vice Premier Liu He. I mean, we have to go back to the time, I think it's May last year, before these tariffs are imposed. How can it be an agreement if the tariffs are still in there, in place? It's just unacceptable. The Chinese government can't explain this to, to, this, to, China, to the Chinese public. So I think uh, this is a foregone conclusion. If we're ever going to have an agreement there, the tariffs will have to be gone, period. You know, we can't accept these things. So I think, uh, but, but having said that, there are ways to address these, uh, you know, enforceable issues. I think the U.S. statement clearly says that it wants an enforceable trade agreement. But the thing is that, you know, it, it, the U.S. side has to um, consider the contextual environment here in China and, and interpret this in a way that is sort of more of a Chinese characteristic. It can impose American sort of a legal system on China in terms of implementing these things. They want these statutory uh, 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 resolutions. They want you know, things to be specified in, in laws and, 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 and other government articles. I mean, this is, this is very, very, very like in the United States ahead of the elections, uh, the Chinese leadership also mm -hmm. faces a domestic pressure from mm -hmm. uh, netizens in their millions concerning core interests. Uh, mm -hmm. And China says over and over that it will not make any concessions on principles uh, such as uh, sovereignty right. exactly. and mutual respect. Uh, having said that, what do you think of China's sincerity in promising, and perhaps we have already executed a part of the agreement, in buying more of the American bins from some of the states which turn out to be the uh, uh, supportive uh, uh, areas for right. Trump's uh, presidential election. Well, I think uh, this is showing China's goodwill towards American farmers. I think they're indeed having a very tough time. Uh, you know, let's set, first set aside the political issue here. Just the, the fact that you know, there are a lot of farmers going bankrupt and farmers committing suicide. Uh, we have news about these things. I think you know, farming is a, is a long-term perspective. You have to start making decisions right now for next year. So I think in this regard, China is showing a goodwill saying, look, you, know, you do your own thing. We are going to buy these things, at least even before we reach an agreement. Uh, provided you do certain things, I think that's what China is coming from. Um, but even with, if, if you consider the political situation, I think the votes from farmers are very important. Um, at least from what I'm uh, reading the U.S. news, farmers are overall, I think, are still very much behind him, um, even though they don't like Trump's, uh, you know, dealing with China. But the thing is that. The, the, you know, in several states in the U.S., especially in the Midwest states, 
um, the, they don't have a choice. I mean, these farmers have never voted for a Democrat. They have never voted for a Democrat. So it's, it's impossible for these people for, to vote for Democrats. So I think, you know, who's going to come to, you know, coming from the Republican side, it's got, it's got to be President Trump. So I think, um, you know, he, he is concerned about this political base, but I think overall he's still quite confident that he will have farmers' votes. Well, that's an interesting issue concerning the attitude uh, or any possible change in the attitude of American farmers uh, who always have voted for Republicans. Now, let me go back to Steve. Uh, what do you think of uh, China's uh, actions to buy American agri agricultural products at this moment, despite our anger and dissatisfaction that the United States has not done enough to respect uh, our core interests and principles? Look, I, with all due respect, I think um, this is a, a non-starter in terms of resolving the conflict between the United States and China. First of all, uh, the agricultural population in the United States is minuscule. It will not swing uh, the election in 2020. It gets focused on from time to time, but uh, for those who truly understand the electoral dynamics uh, in, in U.S. presidential politics, this is, this is a, an issue that doesn't even make uh, the top ten. Number two, um, the United States last year ran uh, bilateral trade deficits with 102 countries. Even if we were to make progress in closing the bilateral trade deficit with China, which is the largest piece of our multilateral imbalance, uh, without addressing our national savings problem and with an expanding budget deficit, uh, that's getting uh, worse, not better, uh, the Chinese piece would just shift to other producers, higher cost producers. So that's why I and most other economists are hugely critical of uh, placing so much emphasis uh, on the soybean uh, solution uh, to this trade uh, issue. The issue is really one um, that has been uh, mentioned briefly by some of the other speakers um, uh, this evening. Uh, bearing on the structural issues uh, and enforcement. And I actually think that we were making some progress on enforcement uh, prior to the early May bit breakdown, and whether or not we can go back to that remains to be seen. And I rather want to see more response from the uh, Russian government uh, on issues of agricultural exports to China. Let's see, let's look at the latest figures concerning almost 65% increase of our imports of Amer uh, sorry, Russian agricultural products uh, uh, since the trade disputes broke out between the two economies. Uh, Robert, what do you make of uh, the readiness of the Russian government to take advantage of the current uh, trade disputes between the United States and China? Well, I think it uh, covers actually many grounds. In fact, uh, it, to acknowledge uh, my employer, we just uh, this uh, week, uh, our edition of the uh, weekly publication, uh, had a cover on how uh, China-Russia relations have changed. And I don't think it's just uh, regarding agricultural products, but a whole host of issues, military uh, alignment, uh, Belt Road, so Russia is definitely benefiting from the increased tensions between the U.S., not only in trade, but in so many ways. And it has definitely been able to use that to its advantage. Uh, our take is that China actually gets more out of that relationship than Russia, but, you know, China is a much larger economy. So basically, to your question, Yang Ray, absolutely. I mean, China is able to go to other trading partners like Russia. And, and by the way, it goes beyond Russia. I mean, it's, it's uh, it struck a kind of, uh, you know, break, how would you say, um, break out a sort of arrangement with Italy on Belt Road. Uh, so the first G7 member to sign up to Belt Road, uh, also a full-fledged EU member. So you know, there are lots of options China has when it uh, reconfigures its uh, trading arrangements. Thank you very much for taking us down the road uh, of uh, a wide range of issues, uh, not only just about uh, imports of agricultural products uh, from Russia, but also Italy as part of the BRI initiative. But John, what do you think of uh, China's efforts to find more alternative markets instead of being, uh, uh, instead of waiting to be killed by uh, 
whatever worst case scenario in the U.S.-China trade negotiations. China is not going to be killed by the worst scenario. Uh, worst case scenario. I think uh, the overall uh, China's exports to the United States, uh, you know, about uh, 500 billion dollars, uh, represents something like uh, between 1 percent to 2 percent of China's GDP. Um, so it's it's not a big deal. Uh, you know, in the worst case scenario, but it this is something mean a we can. Lot of, uh, job, uh, that, that I agree. Loss, that uh, I agree. Yeah. But but yeah. having said that, I would say uh, so far the statistics have been showing that the loss to the um, the trade to the exports to the U.S. has been pretty much picked up by uh, increase of exports in into ASEAN markets, for example, into European markets, into you know those countries participating in the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the all, I mean, so far, first part of this year, overall China's exports has been increasing just by a very small amount. But overall, it's still increasing, given such a you know very adverse macro environment globally, given the fact that we engage in trade war with the United States subject to such a high tariff rates, China's exports still managed to record a, a very small increase. So I think that uh, shows the resilience of the economy, uh, let alone China is also emphasizing the you know, domestic consumption, we're also doing other things, trying to um, uh, you know, mitigate the impact of this trade war. But I think overall, the, the, the danger is not so much in the, the risk is not so much in these numbers. I think the risk is, is the, um, the global value chain that has been striding over the Pacific is broken. I think that's a, that's a real danger. You know, if we are getting to this um, bifurcated world with you know, China-centric and US-centric and you know, the, 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 each have a separate uh, uh, value chain production networks, uh, this is something I would say you know, China is more concerned about as opposed to the, the trade numbers with the U.S. Well, uh, let's look at the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. uh, its monetary policy, uh, the latest moves in its monetary policy uh, uh, has uh, cut the interest rate by 0.25 percent. Mm -hmm. That's a lot in the past uh, few years. Uh, that's a lot. Very impressive. But President Trump says it's not enough. Too, too uh, little, too uh, late. <laughs> too little, too late. But uh, markets fell sharply across Europe. Why? Um, well, I think it's very much uh, expected, um, and um, and also I think there are some uh, doubts about whether uh, money will be rushing into the U.S. Uh, well, the concern is the money will be running out of the U.S. Uh, and uh, uh, the U.S. economy uh, is is probably not going to play the same kind of a role it used to play when interest rates is is uh, is decreased. Um, and the overall global you know, economic uh, conditions are not very favorable at this point, uh, given the you know, trade tensions, given the um, you know, slowing down numbers almost across the board uh, in many countries. So um, the, the world is looking for a leader right now, and uh, it's quite doubtful whether the U.S. could be a leader at this point. Robert, um, what do you think of uh, the immediate response from uh, uh, stock markets? Uh, does it seem that monetary policies by the Fed have been exhausted and uh, you won't uh, see uh, much, uh, much of the impact that the uh, chairman uh, like uh, Powell wants to achieve. Well, their uh, ability to respond to prevailing conditions is hardly limited to this latest move. I think what we've seen is that the markets were expecting more of a commitment for further rate reductions, and Powell was not uh, in any way committal about that. Uh, moreover, you also have a situation where uh, the markets have priced in a lot of what's going on in the world, and the response uh, from the Fed is kind of an indication that actually things aren't as good as they used to be in the U.S. Again, it was already somewhat assumed, but for them to finally take the action and not as much action as was hoped for, I, I would say that's the way to read the market response. It's been a bit of a dip, but bear in mind, stock markets are extremely volatile. I don't think this is going to be a permanent downswing, but, but we'll have to see. Steve, what do you think of the impact of the latest uh, monetary policy uh, on the market? Well, I, I think that um, Chairman Powell had a very difficult time explaining the rationale uh, for the move in his press conference uh, in Washington yesterday. He argued on the one hand, uh, in contrast to what I think it was Robert who just said, that the U.S. economy – 
the outlook is, is in good shape. There is no sign of any deterioration. Uh, and yet uh, he could not truly explain <coughs> the logic behind his move other than to say that um, they felt they needed another move to make certain that the outlook um, remains okay in light of uh, potential uh, global risks. So I think the markets were reacting largely to a communication problem that was prompted by a Fed that was truly unable to uh, articulate with any clarity uh, the ramifications of its, its move uh, in, in the context of a U.S. economy, which it, it admitted uh, is performing quite well at this point, and they're hopeful will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. So I don't think it has anything to do with you know, America's role in the world or the fact that you know, there's no, dollar, no, no funds coming back into the U.S. This was a communication problem that was not handled effectively uh, by the Fed chairman. Thank you very much. John, what do you think of uh, President Trump's uh, call for reforming the WTO by removing the developed country status from countries such as China? Uh, China said in this response, we are still the largest developing country and we should still enjoy the responsibilities and the rights as, as a developing country. Well, uh, this is another uh, one of his uh, long-time demands. Um, you know, his grudge with the uh, international uh, trade governance system. Uh, you know, he has been very unhappy with the fact that several countries, uh, you know, in terms of uh, per capita income, they're relatively high, um, and uh, they're still enjoying development economy status. Uh, now, I think China's case is still quite different. I mean, he, he made the case that, uh, I mean, that this white paper from the U.S. government uh, makes the case that, you know, countries like Qatar, like Singapore, right, I think China doesn't belong to that league. I mean, this clearly does not belong to that league. The per capita income, whether it's nominal or it's, or, or, or it's producing power parity calculation, it's not even close, right? I mean, they're talk I mean these countries are in the $50,000, $40,000 per capita. China is still pretty much in the $10,000 range. So, you know, we're still long way to go. Um, now, the, 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 the report also mentions the fact that you know, China is very advanced in several technology areas, you know, we send vehicles to the moon, stuff like that. But you know, the, the Russians also send you know, stuff to the, to, the, to the outer space a long, long time ago. But look at the Russian economy right now. So I, I don't buy into this argument that uh, you know, trying to cherry pick things to make an argument, but ignore the overall big picture that China's overall uh, GDP per capita. I mean, just talk about the hard number here. It's still way, way down there. You know, about ten thousand uh, dollars. If you're talking about PPP calculation, that's about eighteen thousand dollars at most, at most, which is still half of what, more than half of what, uh, you know, countries like uh, Singapore, Qatar, South Korea, these countries uh, per capita income. Very quickly, let me go back to Robert to conclude our discussion tonight. Uh, what do you think of the importance of a? Uh, 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 I mean, a developing country market status uh, for China at this moment. Why do you think China says we are still the largest developing country? John makes some good points, but I think it's a little more complex than that. If you were to take the eastern seaboard of China, that is really developed. I mean, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, it, it's very hard to argue they're anywhere in a developing world status. But John is quite correct. If you go into the hinterland, uh, in fact, you don't have to go more than a hundred kilometers or so outside of any of those major cities, and it is a developing economy. So the trick is you have a very big mix in China, and WTO rules aren't really well structured for that. Thank you so much for being with us. And that's the end of this discussion about whether we're going to have a breakthrough in the next round of trade talks between the United States and China following uh, the latest meeting in Shanghai where... 47 years ago, uh, the two countries agreed to end their hostility and to start the new chapter. Uh, with that, we come to the end. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.